Welcome to the Harper's Podcast. I'm your host, Violet Luca. In the April issue, Kyle Pauletta examines the mainstream media's about face in climate coverage. And when I say mainstream media, I'm referring to outlets that don't have an ideological commitment to denying it entirely. While research and scientific consensus over the past five years has remained largely the same, writers who once predicted that societal collapse and mass extinctions were imminent are now cheerfully optimistic. Pauletta joined me to discuss this shift, how it reveals macro and micro level problems with journalism, and the science and environmental issues that are being overlooked. At the crux of your piece is the fact that journalism relies on newness and spectacle. And if there's nothing new to report on, there's little left to broker in, especially for daily papers or even online sources. Do you think this reliance on newness is what leads to a kind of pendulum swinging between optimistic and pessimistic climate reporting? I do. Yeah, I think that's kind of the central problem here is... Like I went during my reporting, I talked to Elizabeth Colbert and she said something that kind of stuck with me. She was like, you know, the climate was changing yesterday. The climate is changing today. The climate is going to change tomorrow. So what do you do about that as a journalist? And I do mm-hmm. think there's there's like the old joke that like if this story doesn't change, then you kind of have to change the story to be able to keep writing about it as a journalist and so we have this kind of huge thing that's happening all over the world in discrete ways and very subtle ways and so finding ways to keep telling stories about that becomes harder and harder and i think beyond just the sort of need to make it feel current to people you also have this massive investment in climate journalism that's happened over the past decade or so, which, you know, Mm -hmm. I think is pretty outstanding to see that's one of the few, like, you know, growth areas of journalism in America right now. (laughs) It's somewhere like the Washington Post is staffing up on climate journalists at the same time it's laying out off everyone else. But the more people you have covering a story there, that creates even more impetus to, to find the newness and to find a different angle and to find something dynamic that's happening and you can kind of justify all those big investments that have been made. Yeah. I mean, I think the kind of the rebuttal against even bothering to cover the climate or sort of what, why things got so bad or to the point that they did is that, you know, people don't like to hear about climate change yeah. <laughs> because it is so uh, esoteric and slow, but then also very abrupt and like, it's kind of hard to, to fit into the mold of information we're used to and we're used to receiving which is also a huge problem and it's just a, a larger it's just problem. a real drag too it's just a real yeah you know everything about the world is changing and your personal behavior is making it worse it's like yes. you know it's not a fun all story. the things that you've yes all the things that uh comfort you uh <laughs> that make your life nice they're actually yeah them right away. but but you know, again, there's there's a conversation to be had there, but we're 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 just sort of stuck either in this hot or cold, no pun intended. Um, so I noticed in your piece, you know, you you mention years, but you don't ch- mention changing administrations. So why did you choose to approach uh, that? Like, why? Because you could have very easily have been like, well, you know, as soon as Trump was out of the office. It's, everything is fine right yeah i mean i think i i do mention this sort of like overnight thing that happened after trump was elected but i i think i wanted to stay away from it aside from that because i think it's that that is a real prism of how we look at the climate is who's in the oval office which is just just catastrophically short-sighted like yes you know to <laughs> To say that, like, the climate outlook improved between 2009 and 2017 and then was terrible from 2017 to 2021 and it's fine now. It's just like it's it's so much bigger than 
what any individual administration does. And I think, you know, the Obama administration did some things that helped get solar and wind power to the point where they were, you know, kind of up on this upward trajectory they've been on, but it was pretty limited. And then you have, you know, Biden's big quote unquote inflation reduction act last year, which again is, has provided a lot of really necessary investments at the same time that he's opened up a lot of additional lands to oil exploration. Yes. So, just announced today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's just this real mixed bag. And so, yeah, I, I do think in presidential administrations are useful in terms of how we look at it and how, you know, a media that's overwhelmingly concentrated in New York thinks about these things that, you know, if it's as soon as Trump was in office, we were in this really terrible shape and then the kind of outlook brightened four years later. So I I think that's part of it, but I think it's, I don't think that's all. And I do think there's sort of a, some lagging indicators where, you know, it takes a year or two after Biden comes in before I think we start seeing this real shift in tone, um, Hmm. which I think may have just been the kind of apocalyptic feelings really took a while to work their way out of people's systems. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, and I, you touch on this in the piece, but I think, you know, it also, journalism has a problem with science Mm. because it's different. It's difficult for journalists who aren't scientists to kind of parse these ideas or translate studies into like, again, into the standard newspaper form or you know whatever the media form let's say so what what is your prescription for a way forward like how might science journalists be more responsible um i mean i think i i would make a distinction between daily news reporting or that style and these sort of sweeping overviews of the state of the climate science because I think, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with writing up a report of, you know, tree rings that indicate periods of historic drought or, so, you know, like all of that's just like kind of run of the mill science journalism that has a limited scope, but is very useful in informing people who are interested. Um, and I think that some of the best climate journalism that's happening is very you know, boots on the ground going to a place where there is a real moment of crisis and trying to explain here's what's happening to people and how that fits into these broader trends. I think I think my prescription, if it's anything, would be to like stick with that stuff and back away from these, you know, very long pieces that really try and be all things to everyone. And I think those are the stories that I really focused on in this essay, Mm -hmm. because I think they, they're the ones that force you as a journalist to make the most, take the most shortcuts or take the most, I don't know, just, just, you know, you need to have a thesis. And so like, it becomes how do I take as much evidence as possible that relates to that? And I think it's such an ambiguous situation that any any single thesis you offer is going to have limits and there will be plenty of counterexamples. And it, I, I just don't know how much is really added to people's understanding with that stuff. Right, which is ironic because the, you know, long form Sunday feature style of, you know, uh, style of writing is supposed to be where you get the nuance, where you get this uh, deeper look inside of something. And that, you know, what you what you've described is exactly the problem that that's just an illusion Mm -hmm. and that, you know, that you can just feel like you're following this subject by reading these you know 
what appears in the Sunday New York Times and then miss out on these smaller stories that may or may not contradict that narrative, but they're more they're more accurate or can be more accurate in in in, in letting someone know what what the fuck is going yeah. on with the planet? <laughs> yeah, and I think some, you know, it's not like a certain length is bad. Like, I think the Times Magazine has done some really great stuff. Like, um, they've covered climate migration really well. They've covered, they recently did a big story on the Amazon that was great. So that that's all well and good. I think it's, I think it's the pose of the kind of detached observer where the problem comes in that sort of sense of I'm looking at all this and I'm kind of indexing everything and now I will deliver it to you person in your easy chair on Sunday morning in a way that now you can kind of have a sense of how the climate's going. You know, it's this kind of distillation into a vibe that you you end (laughs) up with this really really blinkered understanding of of the world around you yeah and in your piece it really smartly threads in literary influences on climate writing you know which takes some artistic liberties so who in your view are the most artistically exciting sort of literary climate writers right and this is distinct from you know, the most like hard sci-fi equivalent <laughs> climate, right? Like, <laughs> right, like it's, right. yeah. I mean, I, there's a handful. I mean, I think Claire Bay Watkins is great. Like Gold Fame Citrus, I think is a really good sort of uh, post-apocalyptic vision of California and the Southwest as this kind of Sahara-like um, place and, and I also think like Yoko Tawada, the uh, Japanese writer, has some sort of similar stuff like uh, her book, The Emissary, which is good. And I think she has a newer one that's called Scattered All Over the Earth. That's similar. But these, these sort of like, I think literary fiction is such a great way of, you know, throwing the time scale forward 100 years and just imagining a new world. And I think I kind of, that's the stuff that really appeals to me is this sort of um, not trying to be in the present understanding the climate as we understand it, but kind of taking a bigger risk and being like, what if there was another dust bowl, but it was 10 times as bad? Like, what does that world look like? And that kind of, that's the, and like I joked about sci-fi, but I do think like sci-fi is more helpful in kind of like creating that space for imagination of the world that we are all embarking on, as opposed to I think the the novels and poetry that I criticize in the essay really feel to me like here's someone in New York reading a bunch of the same articles and just being kind of gloomy you know and i'm just like what does does that actually that doesn't actually tell me anything about life now or what life will be it just kind of is like again like here's a vibe and i'm gonna riff on it yeah it's very glib um (laughs) to it the attempt to be contemporary often ends up being very clear yeah totally but i mean so you didn't like uh don't look up <laughs> I did not i mean it Would was you... entertaining like it was i thought it was it was very it was funny. Pretty funny yeah it's, it was a good movie to watch on a plane you know yeah. <laughs> well but yeah but i mean like i i mean i i guess why you know you sort of take aim at adam mckay who you know again He's trying. He's like the only Hollywood sure. guy who is yeah. trying. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't, he, you know, I hated the big short and I really hated Vice, but this was like, at least there were jokes. Yeah. There was less, there was less cringe here. But I mean, what you know, aside from, I mean, but there is, there are elements of realism in that yeah. film. Yeah. 
for sure. Like the the Steve Jobs slash uh, Bill Gates slash um, uh, Elon Musk <laughs> right. character. Very real. Uh, beautiful performance by Mark Rylance, as well as this notion that there's an intractability mm -hmm. here, right? And I guess, because there's this lack of trust, right? There's this lack of trust in media institutions. And to what extent does catastrophism, you know, that there could ever be a hope of gaining back those people who have just decided that climate change is not real. This is some George Soros stuff. Like, I mean, like, you, you don't really touch on that sort of how the polarization mm. of this at all. And I'd be curious to hear why. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I think it's much less polarized now than it once was. Um, like, I think in an earlier draft, I was kind of tracing the whole history of climate journalism going back to the 80s. And you had this long period where, uh, you know, there's Bill McKibben writing about it and not really anyone else. And then Al Gore comes out with a book in uh, I believe 1991, I think it was before he ran for president the first time, um, that, that kind of lists climate change along with a number of other environmental ills as like real areas of concern. And he goes and does the talk shows. And that's one of the first times that's really talked about in a national media. And I think that moment created the real toxic politicization that we all became very used to during the Bush administration. And, and that's, you know, the 90s of when you have all these gas companies investing just ungodly amounts of money and pretty ridiculous research discrediting all the studies that had come before. Ne and in Rush Limbaugh. Yes. And in right-wing media figures. Very s cynical. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Basically, like, doing payola to, to make sure that all the right people are saying the right things. And so you you have that and and I think we're we sort of moved out of um that you know climate denialism into this like very like macabre climate realism <laughs> like um I think uh James Pogue, who is a friend I know he's been on this podcast too he just had a really good profile uh in the times opinion section about this congressman from kentucky who very much acknowledges climate change and at the same time his answer to it is we shouldn't be doing any of these like grand scale investments we need to do like back to the land self-sufficiency mm. libertarian thing so like i think we're like in a weird space where the politicization is not as clear-cut as it once was and you now have some extremely conservative like revanchist figures who are are talking about climate change in very explicit terms at the same time that they're discrediting the you know saying like we don't necessarily need electric vehicles or or something or they're saying we need to be putting all our money into green hydrogen and hydrogen fuel cells and all that. So I think part of why I don't get into it too much is I do think the situation is just like a lot more ambiguous now. And to bring it back to don't look up, I think one of my problems with that movie is in its didacticism, I think it is very much still working under a paradigm that maybe that I, I'd like to think ended in the Trump administration of this just like pure denialism. Look, it takes a long time to make a movie. Sure, right? sure. And, and like that movie very <laughs> that much. TV has the upper hand because <laughs> yeah. it could do, it could respond yeah. very quickly. That right? movie very much <laughs> felt like this was made when Trump was president and it comes out when he's not anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, because it is, you know, because I, I wonder if some of the hesitancy uh, to even sort of broach this subject or, you know, to, to, to sort of temper, you know, the idea that everyone writing for a so-called liberal paper 
has to or a, a liberal outlet has to adopt you know the correct the ideologically correct position mm. i mean that you can't even like when you say the science you know uh, you can't even include scientists who are sort of doubting the thing you have presented as fact even though they those scientists agree that climate change is real that there is this um and it's, I mean, still now you see it across the media. This is sort of a larger problem where there's this hesitancy to sort of break rank mm. on certain issues. Yeah. And again, I'm not, uh, this is not some weird, like, I'm a turf thing. I'm literally just being like, there, 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 there's stuff that gets left out because it doesn't fit the narrative. It doesn't fit the thesis, but it's, it's just as real as anything else presented or even more real than what's being presented in the rest of the piece. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think I get, I think we kind of talk about some of the climate scientists who w went through this period of being like vilified for maybe not quite that intense, but certainly discredited um, for just being a little skeptical of some of the conventional wisdom that was taking shape. Um, like I think one of the ones who I mention most uh directly in the piece it you know he'd become pretty famous for uh, his name's roger Pielke jr he he had become fairly famous for looking at all of these estimates of the damage that hurricanes did and some studies that had shown like, oh, hurricanes are so much worse now than they were. 20 50 100 years ago because look at how much more damage they do in in dollar terms and he had kind of looked at that and been like well there's a there's more things to destroy and between that and inflation like uh, uh, does it society is less fair yeah that there's just kind of not <laughs> not actually a lot of evidence that it's like you know it's putting a, a sticker price of insurance claims onto a hurricane is the best way to judge is it the best way to demonstrate that climate change is bad. Um, and, right. and for saying that, he was, you know, very widely criticized. And um, I think in uh, the David Wallace Wells piece that I talk about, he like pointedly mentions that he was a frequent Republican. Uh, like he appeared at congressional hearings on behalf of Republicans. And even though he also you know had done no end of other research that was like yes climate change is happening it's bad it's just sort of anything that went against a this um this broad sense of things are getting worse and worse every year had to kind of get shut out and yeah i think that's that's very problematic and i think when you're you know, if you're if you're looking at it from the perspective of Democrats or progressives who want climate action and want to talk about we're the ones who listen to the scientists and you need to actually listen when scientists are a little outside the mainstream, because sometimes they're right, too. So, again, just, there's just so much more ambiguity here than we usually allow for. Right. Because it is it, it's science, right? Like it's it's proving something as best as you can prove it, not saying that this is true for, you know, like that's I mean, or at least that's one of the main things I remember from learning yeah. science in school is that it's like, well, yeah, this is the best you can prove it. And so when I don't know. Uh, somebody who wants to teach evolution in school mm -hmm. or wants to deny that the climate is happening it's like well climate change is happening you have to kind of be like well that we're just acting on the information we have now this is the best right. we can prove anything yeah and i think i think there's also this there's a way in which anyone who's ever interviewed a scientist will tell you they just do not say anything declarative like they're, they're yeah you shouldn't and they shouldn't but like they are <laughs> they are trained and i think they genuinely believe in the virtue of saying like yeah this is like it seems to be this it's probable that that other thing and that is really frustrating language when you're a journalist because you want to declare you want to say 
this is X worse than it was five years ago. And or this thing is happening and he, and you should yeah. care. <laughs> yeah. And like the closest scientists will get will be like, yeah, there's like a 90 percent probability that this will happen in the next five years or something like that. And and so, yeah, I think it's that again, it's just like a kind of core problem with science journalism is like, how do you how do you properly contextualize that sort of language without mm. either you know, completely caving to it and just writing something that the reader's like, I, this doesn't tell me anything and also doesn't, you know, go way beyond what the science actually demonstrates. And also not being bored. Right, <laughs> which is the, the <laughs> which most is important the other... thing and is the hardest thing to do. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 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 you got to make the news cool. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, what we're, what we're kind of talking about, it also definitely happened during covid and you know you mentioned towards the end of the, your piece you're talking you're talking about you know the the larger problems with catastrophism and and you write quote many specious stories get conversations going particularly if you count pushback from experts as part of the conversation what gets left out entirely are the costs of catastrophism and dot 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 the the erosion of trust in journalism among precisely those people who need to be convinced that the problem we face is urgent and real. To what extent do you feel like, I mean, again, obviously we're still kind of coming out of COVID. Uh, to what extent do you think that will impact uh, how, how climate reporting is received? Because again, this idea that you know, there are a large group of people because the what was being said changed a lot week to week, month to mm. month. There was this real erosion of trust in uh, in science and what the government was saying. And sometimes that was very warranted and other times uh, it was maybe not. It was perhaps understandable. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like COVID itself will have uh, an impact on climate writing the way it has had on emissions let's yeah. say <laughs> yeah it's a really interesting question i haven't i haven't really tied those two together before but i do think you're right i mean i i think i think for you know we'll say people with graduate degrees or whatever being it's it's much easier to say like oh yeah the scientists said this one week and then one month later, they're saying something different. And you're like, yeah, that's how science is. Like, they were being extremely cautious and got it a little bit wrong at first, but then readjusted. And that's fine. I, I think maybe people who are less familiar with that sort of mode of thinking just heard their governor say this thing and then this other thing or saw on the news you know seemingly contradictory messages and didn't and instead of seeking to reconcile them themselves were just sort of like well this is all bullshit and mm -hmm. i don't blame them i mean i think it's it it asks a lot of an audience to say you must bring all of this critical reasoning and ideally some familiarity with typical epidemiological practice in order to fully decode mm -hmm. this series of news reports over a couple weeks when you're also right. very worried about your job and your family and so on and so on. So yeah, so I don't I don't blame people for becoming a bit more skeptical of the media than perhaps they were before. I do think it does feed into just the the idea that now the climate is a part of the culture war, that the way that we talk about the climate mirrors the way that we talked about, you know, gay marriage 15 years mm -hmm. ago, and that we came to talk about masking and uh, Zoom school during the pandemic, that if there's all the experts are lined up on one side, there is a sizable block of the country that are just going to look kind of askance at that. 
And I think you're you're starting to see that in politics of things like tax credits to buy electric vehicles or, um, you know, trying to lease offshore land for wind farms. I think those are becoming kind of wedge issues in a way that Mm -hmm. they weren't before and i think that's that's pretty concerning um yeah i I, I don't know how as in all areas where there's public distrust of media i think fixing that is really hard and i think the only Mm -hmm. the only real path that i see is just being very engaged with people's day-to-day lives and the actual things that they're facing and and helping people understand why something that's happening in their community may be related to the climate crisis. And here is what the public policy options to address that. And, and just making it really granular and immediate for people, but that's easier said than done when you're, you know, you're have a lot, mostly national news organizations that don't have the resources to be doing that. And, every community with a forest fire or really bad flooding in the spring or South Florida and sunshine flooding and all that. So yeah, it's tough. It's, it's challenging. You know, as a, as a counterpoint to catastrophism, another genre of climate reporting is uh, solutions journalism, Mm -hmm. right? So what are what are your general thoughts on this approach? You know, is it just like a good foil to doom scrolling or I think it depends how it's how it's executed. Um like I talked to Sammy Roth from the LA Times for this and I think he's a reporter I really admire and he covers uh primarily energy in California and the rest of the West. Um and I think He's very clear eyed about I have a bias towards things that will prevent the worst form of climate change, but I don't have a bias towards, you know, what is the best way to do that. And so I think that like he's he's very focused on solutions and what different solutions look like and what are what are the numerous ways we can address this stuff. But it's all very much in the world, like, here's what's happening in different communities, and here's different things that are proposed. I think the solutions journalism I find kind of odious is this kind of, you know, what kind of light bulb should I put in my house? Or, you know, like, I think yeah. there's there's a way that, that that's such a vague term, solutions. And it can become this very just like, I don't know, like I, I think they mentioned the Washington Post just hired like a climate advice columnist. So people are like, oh, I, you know, I want to re-roof my house. What's the greenest way to do that? And I'm just, I don't know. I'm just that. And there's a link to Amazon. Exactly. I'm bottom. like, that to me feels very much like weird, like customer service in a way that yeah. I'm like, I don't, I don't think that. You know, that's useful for individuals who have certain questions, but like, that's not, that's like product reviews. That's not, that's not doing anything about how we kind of understand the world. Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, when it first started, paid content was really obviously paid content, but now it's gotten extremely advanced. Yeah. And you, <laughs> in a way that's quite disturbing. You know, like the wire cutter and stuff that's like fully integrated oh into the Times. Yeah. Yeah. If like you go to the like you go to the Times web uh, the homepage, it's just sort of like a good like fifty percent of that is just paid yes. <laughs> stuff. Or like or just like vague just sort of like kind of winding you up to push you in a certain direction to find yeah. something. Yeah, so I think my my fear with quote unquote solutions journalism is that it's just like a a way to dress up that that sort of advertisement as journalism and and make it feel virtuous because it's about climate change. It's you know, yeah, yeah, and I mean it, the the obviously the other problem with that is 
this idea that it's us, our, it's our choice as consumers to that we could ever possibly, if enough yeah. of us buy the right, you know, roofing, <laughs> roofing right. materials, if we just get a band together that we're going to turn back the clock on this stuff, yeah. it's like, well, no, there's, there are these, there are t- nine or 10 corporations that are doing the vast, the overwhelmingly yeah. the, to doing these emissions are polluting the planet. Why can't we just sort of, you know, knock on Raytheon's door or whoever right. and just be like, stop, yeah. stop. And, and there's not more focus on sort of the corporate um, ir- irresponsibility. Yeah. I mean, you've got all of the like production of, iron and steel in the world creates more emissions than every car you know like yeah. there, there's things like that where you're like the the scale of the problem is so much bigger that like even the best version of this stuff like the wire cutter i think maybe last summer did a thing that was like what's the best artificial lawn but it was very like <laughs> scandalous because they were like there isn't a best like all of these products are trash and really, if you live in a climate <laughs> where you can't grow grass normally, you should just have natural plants or xeriscaping or, or yeah. tile. Um, <laughs> and, and I thought that was like, oh, it's a little bold to be like, hey, all of these things aren't, aren't actually good. And, and I definitely respect them for doing that. And also, like, it just feels like such small potatoes, you know? Yeah. Um, so I guess what to you are some climate writing red flags that signal the publisher or the writer might not be entirely rigorous Mm -hmm. in their reporting? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I think, I think the biggest one is just the scope. I think the bigger the scope is, the more wary you should be about a climate article. Like I, I think, you know, locals great, nationals fine, global. I don't know if you're actually going to learn very much from it. And then, I, and I think the corollary to that is like the further, the more it is about the future or anticipation of something, the less useful it is. And like I, 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 when I brought this up to climate journalists, I think a lot of them get talked pretty persuasively about like, listen, talking about the future, it motivates people. It makes people see what the stakes are. It kind of gives us, it you know, puts a marker in the ground to use that cliche, um, <laughs> and that's all well and good, but it just is so ephemeral. And like, I think the biggest thing that I was reacting to with this essay is just like, you can't tell me the hundred year outlook of the world changed so profoundly in five years. Like it just, it, it's yeah. just ridiculous. And so yeah. I think getting back to that idea of like trust, the more times you have a hundred year outlook that changes, the less anyone's going to trust you. And, and I think, the more we can focus on the here and now because this is where the climate crisis is happening. Like it is, it is unfolding every day with the, you know, you mentioned the Willow project in Alaska, it's like 240 million tons of carbon over the next 30 years. Like that, that's what the focus should always be on. And yeah, the, the more you're just trying to like, turn that into one of a thousand data points that the less I think the average reader can really really gain from it what are what are some of the possible material consequences of climate optimism so we were just talking about like well there's a way to think we can buy our way out of this but there's also now now we're in the new era uh, David Sirota and Adam McKay have to make a new movie <laughs> addressing oh, this God. new era. I hope Netflix has enough money to to pay for it. I know they're kind of hard. Look, up they, right they, now. they throw money at everything. <laughs> it's fine. It's yeah. insane. Um, I mean, I think the the 
biggest consequence is that it it takes away people's urgency it takes away the sense that this is a problem we haven't figured out yet you know like i think the more the more you read about the you know pre- like solar and wind are now cheaper than natural gas the more you hear something like that the more you think like oh we're on the right track but i think all you really by focusing on that stuff you miss you know bp made like 27 billion dollars last year which was double what it made the year before and then it announced that it was changing its goal of lowering emissions by the end of this decade from more than 35% to 20%. And so you're like, you you can focus on the good news and miss the real problem, which is these massive corporations making pledges that everyone knows are bullshit and then steadily walking them back when people aren't looking. And I think it's harder to hold them accountable when you have this attitude of progress. We've got this figured out. We just need to kind of like keep the good momentum going. Right. And you've written a book about American Southwestern cities, which is coming out next year. Does that book consider how climate change will affect those cities? And I mean, what did you learn about those cities' possible futures while writing? Yeah, so kind of the the premise of the book is, so I, I grew up in Albuquerque and have been living in the Northeast for the past, I don't know, 10 years, something like that. Um, and I think just looking at, the climate science like much of what the climate in the southwest is is going to be in the rest of the country very soon Uh, things like you know 125 degree days that right now only really happen in the in the middle of the mojave those are going to be highs that get hit in houston and chicago not that long from now. And so I think it's the book is sort of an attempt to say here here is the reality of the southwest right now and here is this climate that a lot of people hear about you know a stretch of 100 de- days over 100 degrees in Phoenix and think like how could someone live there? But the truth is, buddy, get ready. Yeah, the truth is, more than five million people live there, and there's, I think, there are lessons to be learned from the Southwest, and like some of the stuff I talk about in the book is, uh, kind of like architectural innovations and and ways to keep buildings cool that aren't totally reliant on air conditioning, or, um, you know, way to ways to reuse water and to recycle water as it becomes scarce not just in the southwest in california but a lot of other communities so there's sort of some lessons to be learned but i think there's also just a kind of attitude about the climate that i think is important as the climate worsens for the rest of us to embrace which is not you know which is this idea that like the climate is hostile like the climate is not necessarily there to make life easy for you and so how do you respond to that like how do you how do you build a community that just sort of takes that into account and adjusts accordingly so that you can still have a good life and you know do pursue the things that are important to you rather than constantly being bewildered by every storm that comes every drought and like I I live in Boston now and we had a really bad drought throughout New England over the summer and everyone was just just so perplexed like it just the idea of grass that wasn't green was just 
really alarming and hard to digest for people. And I just think like, yeah, the the things are going to be different and it's not going to snow in New York as much anymore. And we're going to have droughts in New England. And how do you, how do you kind of internalize that and, and not, not be catastrophic about it, but just sort of say like, this is reality. Like, how do we, how do we still make this a, a good place for people to live? Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, to what extent have you, do you feel like there have been journalists who have attempted to deal with this adjustment? Because again, it is, it's going to be an adjustment. Like you said, we cannot, we simply cannot rely on air conditioning. Everyone in the United States has it, or nearly everybody, but there are other things to, other ways to approach that problem. And we've just elected never to take those other roads. But I mean, because this is, this is kind of going beyond this is like solutions to diff- uh, solutions journalism, but better. <laughs> so, no. so what do you, what do, you know, again, so are there any, is there, you know, are there other writers who are kind of considering this holistic society, you know, the rearranging of society in terms of what we expect, yeah. what we, you know, how buildings are made, how we get, a, how we travel, just a basic, basic, like, uh, I don't know, just basic sort of material goods. Yeah, yeah I think there's a handful. I mean, I, I think like Jake Biddle has a, a book out this month called The Great Displacement that is really about these issues of sort of like as because of climate migration, you're gonna have people moving all over the country and how do we how do we kind of flexibly accommodate them? Um I I think that a lot of it though is really like i think a lot of the problem is the compartmentalization of climate change over here and all these issues over here where like the more i talk to people you're like you know if if we have these big sprawling cities that instead of building new subdivisions we were doing you know, mid-rise infill that was supported by public transit. Like, yeah. like that's the biggest thing you could do to reduce water use, to use energy more efficiently, um, all that kind of things. And like, that's not, I don't think people would say like, you know, we need to, we need to fund the light rail in Tucson as a climate change thing, but it, but it is. And like, I think yeah. things like, um agriculture like there's been a a fair amount of notice recently of how water intensive alfalfa is to grow and you grow alfalfa to feed cows and if we didn't kill so many cows to eat them we wouldn't need so much alfalfa suddenly there's a lot more water available (laughs) and like so there's like there's all these things that like all of that adds up into a more climate resilient world even if it doesn't it you know even if it doesn't go under that vertical on the washington post homepage. yeah it's yeah we just need more people who are unafraid to be commie pinkos yeah absolutely (laughs) i just feel like look isn't that always the lesson (laughs) literally (laughs) I mean, because I, uh, I will say I've been watching Chernobyl, the HBO series yeah. Chernobyl, and all I could all I can think about is that you know, this is happening in East Palestine. Yeah. Like a version of this is happening in East Palestine, and obviously the whole thing is like a metaphor for Trump's lies. Right. But then I was like, this, this is this. No, this is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> at least the soviets evacuated people yeah. they waited too long but they got them out of there totally. what the fuck yeah <laughs> yeah there's there's horrific consequences of this stuff not to mention all of the communities where there's that kind of toxic stuff getting thrown into the atmosphere by power yeah. plants or you know that <laughs> um uh, like i've been doing a lot of research recently about south phoenix which is the part of the city that is primarily hispanic and black 
And that's where all the industrial facilities are. And there's all this polluted ground mm-hmm. where people's homes are and stuff. And like, I, I mean, I think what's happened in East Palestine is abhorrent, but there's so many places where that happens slowly over 20 years. Exactly. And, and that's, that's part of environmental justice, right? Is like, is yeah. preventing that and, and resuscitating the earth from, for those people. And like, you know, when you talk about it in those terms, you do sound like a Sierra Club wacko, but it's it's real. It's what, <laughs> what needs to happen. Yeah. Sorry, guys. No more AC. No. You just can't. I know. I know it's gonna. It, you'll you'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about. It. Listen, these uh, the heat pumps are pretty effective. Those are pretty good. Might might need more of those. <laughs> well, Kyle, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so much. This is great. You've been listening to the Harper's Podcast. The music is Cut and Shoot by Febrifuge. The New York Times called Harper's America's most interesting magazine. Receive elegant, insightful, and wry writing from the best journalists, essayists, critics, novelists, and poets every month in our print magazine and gain access to our digital archive, which stretches back to 1850. Visit harpers.org slash save to subscribe for only $16.97.